Good afternoon, welcome to the UK Column News. It is the 23rd of October 2014 and it's just gone one o'clock. Myself, Louise Collins, Brian Garish and Nick are here in Plymouth and we have Vinny on with us today from the People's Internet Radio over in Ireland. Over to you, Garish. Uh, don't know what to say. The weather is apparently um, drizzly and grey in Pembrokeshire. Nobody else is commenting on the weather. It's obviously too embarrassing. So once again, we'll say much the same here in Plymouth. Uh, Grey, drizzly, not very nice. Enough of that. Let's cheer ourselves up with um, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Okay, last night this article appeared in The Standard. It's reporting that London is looking at a £94 billion shale, gas and oil payout. The Conservatives are claiming that Greenies are putting the windfall at risk by scaremongering the public. And and, uh, Ian Crane in that bracket, I suppose. And the the capital will only see the benefits if Boris champions the fracking industry. Uh, Tony Arbour, who is a Conservative, has spoken out and said concerns have been overplayed and says that the research that he has done, he has drawn upon the British Geological Survey uh, that estimates 4.4 billion barrels of shale oil are under South London um, around and around Kent and that this is an opportunity that must not be missed. A spokesperson for Boris said he is a firm supporter of fracking and repeated uh, his statement that no sh- stone should be unturned around London um, if gas is there. So good luck with all that, Londoners. That's uh, pretty incredible, isn't yeah. it, that that man is taken seriously on, on any subject. Uh, but this is quite interesting because um, I think it was Nick or Mike found this one this morning. And when we started to discuss it, we said, uh, we think this applies to uh, fracking. So politics.co.uk here. Very interesting article. Encourage everybody to go and visit the site and read it. Very quietly, the coalition tries to dismantle judicial review. Now, we've quickly labelled this the goose step to a police state, and that is what it appears to be to us. Uh, but what this is really doing is is giving justice, if we can use that term, uh, to the state and certainly to the rich and uh, famous. So in the um, report by politics, uh, they give, first of all, some examples of how people have successfully used judicial review to stop things which they believe are not right. So... Uh, the erection of a 66-metre wind turbine next to somebody's home. They couldn't do anything about it, but eventually it was helped through by... It was, sorry, it was helped by judicial review. Uh, The Department of Education stripped head teachers of their discretion to approve uh, absences during term time. So parents suddenly worked out they needed to fight it. They used judicial review. Um, And I'll give you one more... Um, when Chris Grayling was found to have turned legal aid into an instrument of discrimination, that was challenged with legal. Um, that was uh, challenged with judicial review. Um, so along comes the government, and they are actually challenging um, judicial review itself. Um, they're not going to ban it or do anything obvious. They're basically undermining it. Um, so. They're making it too expensive and risky for anyone who, uh, anyone unless they are very wealthy, to actually get involved with this, uh, because what they're going to do is start to put costs on anybody who gets involved with it. So they say here that it exposes friends, relatives, and associates of a claimant to financial costs. It makes charities and non- non-governmental organisations who get involved liable for costs. And it shields public bodies which have acted unlawfully from public scrutiny. So the main thing here is you try and challenge the government. You use the um, you use the uh, weapon of judicial review, and now they're going to slap costs on anybody who gets involved. And we think this is absolutely targeted uh, to stop protesters, such as people who've been protesting yeah. against fracking. Uh, fracking. Um, The government here is now starting to say, no, no, we're going to take any form of justice away from ordinary people in order to protect our policies. Mm. Amazing. And uh, where do we go? Where does it lead to? Well, this says it all, doesn't it? Thanks to someone who sent this to me uh, last night. Uh, Ian McColland, who uh, is about to face amputation of his leg after drug addiction, uh, had his benefits stopped for nine weeks when he went to change his benefits. Apparently, he did miss out on payments because apparently he failed to attend uh, some meetings. But Mr Mulholland did admit stealing £12.60 
worth of food. Apparently, he was unable to get to the food bank as his leg was so infected. The judge sentenced him to six weeks in prison and then for the theft of the food and then a further eight weeks uh, for another offence. So we're getting murderers let off. We've just had that Oscar Pistorius, who murdered his girlfriend, allegedly murdered his girlfriend, only got ten. Um, he got five years expected to be out in ten months, and someone steals twelve pound sixty of food, and they're jailed for six weeks. And he's weeks. got a bad leg, and he's been put in prison, as we will see later in today's program. Um, what possibly could happen to him? Yeah, I wonder. So guest so, time. Guest Over time. To Ireland. Hello, Vinny. Hi, Lou. You look very smart. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, a bit of polish for today. Okay. okay. We're going to start about all the Irish water. Now, first of all, I want to bring viewers' attentions to uh, this article. Well, it's just a, a little bit of information about the water in Ireland. And here we go. Uh, Ireland is fluoridated, and it has been since uh, approximately 2002, I believe. Um, but now Irish water are um, wanting to start charging. Well, they have started charging people for the water. Um, the first article I've got here, Vin, is uh, an article from the 30th September where the BBC are reporting that households across Ireland were about to be charged for water. These charges are apparently a big part of the international bailout deal and the charges apparently came into, uh, into force on the first of this month. So do you want to take it away, Vin? Yes, well, uh, actually, I believe uh, fluoridation in Ireland goes back approximately 50-odd, 60 years, perhaps. Oh, right, okay. In relation to the water charges, people have been paying for water services through various other taxations in the past. Uh, the interesting thing about the new uh, attempt it's, uh, to charge for water uh, under the Water Services Act in 2013, uh, it's an act to make provision in relation to the installation and maintenance of water meters in dwellings. And that word dwellings is key to this conversation because in Ireland, uh, the Irish Constitution, Article 40.5, clearly outlines the dwelling of every citizen is inviolable and shall not be forcibly entered save in accordance with law. Now why that's interesting is because the water meters are being installed uh, in the actual dwelling, strictly speaking, because from, over in Ireland most people who own property will tell you that from the garden gate to the centre of the road is actually part of the dwelling. And it's, it's private property but with public access, it's not actually public property. Uh, and once the uh, housing estates are usually completed, people usually uh, allow or facilitate the local council to, uh, they use the term, take over the housing estate for uh, things like road services and bin collection and what have you. But people do have the right to um, rebut and refute that uh, and, uh, you know, undo that uh, idea that they can reclaim that part of their property back as private property and they can give access to uh, private individuals etc but they can revoke uh, public access to that property it is theirs okay um, the second story we've got here is about the amount of people who are upset about the new charges that were going to come into force. If we can get that slide up there. Have, there have been um, many protests going on around Ireland um, and bills apparently are looking at a, a approximately being around €176 Euro, uh, for somebody single and up to €500 Euros for family and um, there's been protests yet across across. Uh, Ireland, and there's also been outcry that this or Irish Water Company have been giving uh, bonuses to staff. So, um, this this is it a new company? This company here, the Irish Water. Well, they formed it under the umbrella of On Board Gosh, uh, which was the gas board over here. And uh, again, a little bit of research on them, will, you'll discover they were set up initially, uh, like the electricity supply company, as trusts. Um, so it's interesting the structure they've chosen for this. It's not exactly uh, a public company and it's not exactly a private company. It's, uh, they tried to blur the lines, as it were. Um, the interesting thing is they are also operating, according to many people here, without a valid license because they are not, as we say, a, an official state body. And it begs the question, how can a just standard corporation uh, impose uh, anything, in fact, on private citizens in their own dwellings. Okay. Um, then we've got the the chief of Irish Water, Irish Water, who we've got c coming up now. Um, apparently, he's been um, giving bonuses to staff up to nine thousand while people are struggling because I think they're going to get the first bid in July, um, in January, aren't they, Vin? So they say. Uh, my own feeling is that uh, Irish Water is not going to happen. I, the protests on the streets have been huge. 
The difference is now people don't have to go and attend a protest march anywhere. They literally brought it to your door uh, individually. So, you know, it's, um, it's quite uh, strange in that um, huge numbers of Angarda Shia Khana are being employed to protect, it seems, uh, the installation, the forced installation of water meters. Uh, there's also questions about the RF frequencies given off by uh, the uh, electronic devices in the water meter. There's health concerns. There was also a very interesting video put up, which I mirrored, whereby um, a local councillor, Alan Laws, I believe his name was, he showed how easy it would be to dismantle the water meter from outside your home, inject possibly some type of a poison. He used a, a food colouring to do so. And he put the water meter back in and he went into the home. He turned on the tap and within 30 seconds, uh, red dye was coming out of the tap. So it also exposes, uh, you know, the likes of perhaps foreign embassies, etc., who may have water meters installed on their premises. Uh, they are open to this form of ab potential abuse. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm very, very interested in the form of this com um, company, the trust. You've said, um, you described it as falling between the two. I, I think this is absolutely <coughs> deliberate because if you can't pin it down as a company and you can't pin it down as a as a bona fide public sector body, then the uh, organisation has disappeared into a no man's land. So it's become unaccountable to the public. That's that's my take on what's happened there. Don't know well, interestingly, uh, there was a book written, I believe he was a High Court judge, maybe even Supreme Court, uh, Judge Keane, and uh, in, in the book, uh, I believe it's called uh, Conveyancing in Ireland, and he actually mentioned that these companies, uh, so-called companies, were actually set up as trusts, and they had a different, uh, let's just say there was a different perspective applied to them. And it seems that uh, in Ireland in particular, because uh, in the Irish constitution, the people are considered sovereign, that um, the, the way these companies are structured, they are not charging you for the water itself. Uh, it's the metering service. Mm. What about the mainstream media, Vin? What are they saying about it all? Are they, are they, getting, behind, are they getting behind the public or are they no. sort of siding with, with, the, with the corporation and government? Mainstream media are very quiet on this issue. Uh, the, the silence is deafening, as they say. They are reporting some instances. Uh, they're very keen, it seems, to report instances where uh, protesters uh, are the people. I don't like that term, protesters. It's the people. Um, if they perhaps uh, perform a little faux pas or say or do something that they believe to be not quite right, uh, they're very quick to jump on that. Also, apparently, they've put out a kind of a blanket injunction from the courts that anybody who has knowledge of the injunction who uh, knowingly interferes with the water meter installation can be fined, penalised, etc. Nobody has, uh, as far as I know, been arrested specifically under that. But uh, again, we'll wait and see. Yeah. Go Sorry, if I'm, if I'm out, what about politicians there in Ireland? Is, is there any signs of any of the mainstream politicians waking up to why these protests are happening? Um, very few, it would seem, seem to be on the side of the people they're claiming to be. And they, of course, are saying, well, if you elect us, we'll, uh, we'll undo it. Uh, but interestingly, even the politicians who up to now, and I won't make the name of uh, political parties, but uh, up to now, some of them uh, who were very strongly against it, have also come out and said that they will be paying their water charge, which has disillusioned an awful lot of their membership. Yeah, I can imagine. Ben, we're just going to bring up this Water Act, uh, the Water Services Act here. And um, is this piece you, you sent me earlier, is, is this the relevant piece about the dwellings? Yes. Um, also, I'd ask people to take note of the Interpretation Act as well. When reading any of the acts, uh, you must also check in the Interpretation Act to see if they've applied a different meaning to the word. In this case, I've checked for dwelling and they haven't. So we are, uh, if you will, facilitated to uh, understand that the meaning they're applying to the word dwelling is the meaning that's applied from uh, the 1937 Constitution. So what can you see? I just want to know what, what Vin can see happening come January. Are, are, are people going to be um, paying their bills, do you think, or is there I, going to be a lot of court cases going on? I don't think so. Uh, there's been a huge, uh, we, we many years ago began uh, something along the lines of what uh, uh, was happening over there with the return to sender methodology. And I believe now up to 80,000 people have taken their water meter pack and put a label on it saying return to sender and various other texts. 
and uh, uh, I believe there was a photograph taken from on post inside the post the post depot, whereby there was approximately eighty thousand of these returned packs in a in a big cage in there. That's very significant. Um, I, I don't believe anybody is uh, really going to willingly pay this. What they'll do probably is they'll announce that civil servants, of course, will find themselves in very sticky situations if they attempt to not pay. And I believe they will then uh, disclose their figures as uh, suggestive of uh, voluntary compliance, whereas for a civil servant, it's really not voluntary compliance. They pretty much have to comply. But they will attempt to use that figure to uh, convince, I suppose, more and more people to, to comply. I can't see it happening myself. I, I think this is a bridge too far for the Irish people. Right, I, really Vinny, I just want to get this one quickly while it's on screen and I can read it. But uh, um, an Adrian P has said, personally, I do not think water metering is unreasonable. It seems completely fair that we each pay the, uh, for the amount we actually use. Nothing more, nothing less. Discourages extravagant and irresponsible use of a finite, finite resource. Now, I know what, what my reply to that would be, but what, what's your reply? Well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, this is Ireland. Uh, they have actually been delayed installing water meters, uh, quite ironically, due to flooding in many areas. Mm. So, you know, there is no shortage of water here. The water system does need plenty of work. The people have been paying for it down through the years. It begs the question, where did all that money go if it didn't go into the upkeep of the actual existing system? And there's also there's another issue uh, with the metering of water. I don't think people would ha uh, object per se to an actual uh, recording, for example, if it was a w once a month usage figure. But there's privacy issues here because these electronic smart meters can literally uh, tell you when somebody flushes the loo. Uh, it begs a question for people who will be unemployed and maybe uh, other uh, uh, accessing other state services because this data will be collectible. And combined with data from other smart meters, it will be possible to invade your privacy in a way nobody has imagined before, i.e. if you claim you're looking for work and you're on the dole, for example, uh, they will be able to call you in in a couple of months' time and say, on that day, there, there and there, you claim to be out looking for work and yet your water meter, your electricity smart meter and your gas smart meter have told us there was somebody in your home. Exactly. And the other thing is water is just a basic right of life, is it not? Like the air that we well, breathe absolutely. and the water, you know, so I'm oh, well, sorry to disagree was, with you, Adrian. There was an executive, there. I can't remember what the firm was now, but uh, there was one of the big global companies, Nestle, yeah. was it? Some, yes, it was. Who said the water wasn't it was Nestle. Uh, a basic right yeah. for people. So so it's got to be bottled, but it's got to be treated. I hope he's applying that to himself first. And, um, uh, two days without, sorry, live. What's you that? have to say, Nick, because I can't we see. Two days without water. We can. Uh, right. so what Nick's showing us is that uh, if you actually haven't had anything to drink for two days, you're you're going to be starting to get into uh, problems. Yeah, Finn, let's just quickly move on. You're doing unbelievable things with a bit like what Guy Taylor's been doing over in this country, with stopping evic evictions and standing up for for mortgages and. Um, Standing up to the courts as well. Can you just tell everyone? I know everyone will be gang well dying to know what you've been up to. Okay. Well, again, uh, I fully support all the guys over there who've been doing fantastic work, like Guy Taylor and yourselves, uh, etc. Um, many people. I, I, for example, have been telling many English people about the English Constitution. I'm actually quite knowledgeable on your Constitution, and I only wish a lot more English people were knowledgeable about it. Um, I also recommend a very good book for English people to begin their research. It's called Chalmers and Asquith, Outlines of Constitutional Law. I highly recommend you get that book if you're over in England. Chalmers and? Asquith, Outlines of Constitutional Law. Okay, thank you. For, for English people, they really need to understand their constitution. Um, over here, um, as far as we're concerned, one eviction is one eviction that's not going to happen. We will not permit evictions over here. We just absolutely will not. It's abhorrent. It's repugnant to the Constitution. It's, um, quite frankly, I consider it a crime against uh, humanity. OK, well, Vinny, thank you for giving us that uh, very concise report on what's <laughs> happening with the water. Um, can, you get, can you point us where people can go maybe to see um, any film, video, YouTube clips on this particular subject. 
Uh, well, actually, I'm in the middle of making one at the moment myself and uh, Ben Gilroy from Direct Democracy Ireland. Uh, we made a very good clip. It'll be ready, hopefully, in the next couple of days. Uh, I will be pulling in, uh, and it'll be an assemblage, if you will, of many of the other clips that have been out there from all the other groups who've been doing fantastic work. Uh, the Hub, the Anti-Eviction Task Force, guys like that. Um, loads and loads of guys have been really applying themselves to this. If I can just put one uh, last uh, caveat in before we go. Yeah. We also have developed a process to assist people managing their finance. We call it, we have to call it something to spread it on the internet. It's known as the official offer process. It is completely formed from the structure of the legal system. It's uh, nothing fancy. It's very basic and it's very effective if performed correctly. How do people find out about it, Vin? What's their website? There's a Facebook page, There's a Facebook page uh, official offer on, on Facebook and you will find Official it. offer? Yes, and there are examples. It's, it's a methodology to pay even though you haven't enough to pay, it's based on the doctrine known as uh, the doctrine of substantive or substantial performance. Okay, Vin. Totally but there's, there'll be stuff on the people's internet radio.com well, as well, isn't there? Yeah, well, yeah. Thanks, Vin. I'll speak to you later. Thank you. Bye. Excellent. Well, it's interesting. And what are, we, what are we seeing on supposed mainstream news? Has there been anything on BBC at all about what's happening? Yeah. I don't think so. Well, this is a, a fascinating little article and we're going to ask for some help because it's uh, sent in to us and the story is very simple. A uh, Kent police officer has unfortunately died at the age of 43. Uh, but um, the comment that came with this article is that the article is remarkable because there's absolutely no details given of the cause of death of this policeman. And yet, if you delve into other reports... Uh, he a very, was a very significant individual in that he'd uh, been given an award for helping to break down uh, a very large and well-established paedophile ring uh, where suspects were identified in Kent, Devon and Manchester and uh, four people directly involved in the abuse were arrested. So we are going to just ask for a little bit of help on this. Uh, we're following a little bit of a hunch here, uh, but the person who sent it in says... Here was a police uh, policeman not only doing his job, he was doing more than his job. Uh, he was rewarded for his work trying to protect children. Uh, he now dies at a remarkably young age of 43, but there's nothing about how that actually happened. So whether you're in the um, Kent area or you're in another part of the country, if you know anything about this, uh, we would be grateful for more information. Bearing in mind, of course, that it is a sensitive issue um, and um, just consider uh, his family when you uh, are doing any researching you're doing. But is there more to this story than meets the eye? We'll see. Well, that brings us on neatly to the ongoing saga with uh, Fiona Wolfe in uh, children's clothing. Yeah, indeed. And uh, this is... Um, this is uh, one of the reports that's in The Independent, uh, which is uh, saying uh, what's been going on with her. OK, next one. Uh, we'll just bring oh, in these. Okay. To, well, just these are some of the things being, be, being said. Um, the comment here in this article is that they're intrigued that the Home Office had hopefully worked with Wolf. Uh, I'm sorry, it helpfully worked with Wolf on the final version of her letter to the Home Secretary, which she revealed the dinners. So she didn't do it off her own back. She was she was coached yep. into how to respond. Yeah, she wrote that letter. Yeah. And then um, uh, in the uh, in the questions that she went through, she kept repeating that she had a steely determination to get to the truth, including on behalf of the victim community. Uh, she was a bit nervous, but it's this bit down the bottom which we found found uh, very interesting indeed. Um, there was a lady. Uh, behind her who she was seeking advice from and um, eventually she said well she seconded but she's independent now um, so this is somebody from the home office actually in place helping her now but they're saying well she's not really government because she's independent now she's helping me that makes no sense well absolutely. Is, is this woman actually okay do you think i is think she... well i think she's absolutely okay i think that the trouble is that they are desperate to get somebody who is going to do a cover-up the cover-up is a difficult job because the abuse is very widespread and what we're seeing is daily the cracks coming in the system so 
Well, you're going to tell I us more about this I don't think she's very lady. well, personally, but OK. Uh, pictures were released last night, um, put more pressure under Fiona Wolf to resign as head of the child abuse inquiry. A picture of Wolf and uh, Lady Britain chatting to news anchor and journalist Martin Lewis at the Dragon Awards last year. Um, but it now seems Mrs Wolf did not mention this in a letter to Theresa May, that it was just one single occasion and one social event that Miss Wolf had been with Lady Britain, uh, because other than the one on the uh, on the, the the Dragons Award of uh, 2013. Um, so if we just go and have a look at how many times here we go, dinner parties, coffees, and fun runs. So as we've said many many times, uh, they live on the same street. Um, many dinner parties. Uh, Mrs. Wolfe and Lord Britton both sat on the advisory board of the lobbying group, the City UK. Um, in October 2005, Lord Britton spoke at a conference hosted by the Law Society when Mrs. Wolfe was vice president of that society. Uh, Mrs. Wolfe says she met Diana Britton for coffee on a number of occasions, and both Mrs. Britton and QC, um, Mrs. Britton QC and Lady Britton served as lay magistrate as the City of London Magistrates Court. Um, they, they went into a fun run where Mrs. Wolfe sponsored Lady Britton £50, and they've been at award ceremonies as well. So she's telling Porky Pies, oh, she's not very well, and she's got too many, using too much aluminium in her deodorants and everything else, and she's forgetting things. My okay, so the sar sarcasm meter has just gone up. Sorry. Yes. So um, if you say, well, that's just the Telegraph, um, why should we, ta uh, sorry, that was the Daily, Daily Mail. Mail, why should we take any notes of the uh, Mail? Uh, let's come in at a different angle. So let's have a look at some of the personalities. Now we're calling this the most transparent cover up that uh, British Parliament has ever attempted. And remember, it's a cover up of the vile abuse of children. Uh, we are not going to use the word exploitation because no. we think this is part of the cover-up itself. Um, but let's have a look. Well, we mentioned this lady yesterday, Sharon Evans, Chief Executive of Dot Com Children's Foundation. Uh, we'll come back to her. Um, these are all the committee members that have been appointed now. Dame Moira Gibb, she's uh, ex-Chief Executive Officer of Camden. Uh, she's also a non-executive director of NHS England, and we're going to be mentioning them a little bit later in today's uh, news. Uh, we've got Ben Emerson QC from Matrix Chambers, uh, and he's uh, involved in the Children's Rights Alliance. We've got Graham Wilner, MBE, Lantern Project. Now, this man um, uh, is detailed on the internet as an abuse survivor, so uh, maybe this is somebody brought in to give the to attempt Absolutely. to give the thing some yep. substance we, we'll see we'll have a look at him uh, Barbara Hearn uh, OBE notice all of the establishment awards you only usually get those if you're part of the establishment um, she's a social worker with a very interesting record I think she's also involved with the Tavistock uh, clinic up in London uh, here we've got the barrister Ivor Frank uh, Centre for Social Justice uh, also involved with the Mindful Policy Group. Uh, we'll be having a good look at that in due course. Uh, Professor Terence uh, Stevenson, Nuffield Professor of Child Health. Um, Professor Jean Pierce, here we are, another Ward OBE, Professor of Young People and Public Policy. And here's the connection in UNESCO. So now mm. we're straight into the UN's policy on children. And uh, Drusella Sharpling, uh, I, I, I have to say the name D <laughs> Drusella, I, I just, it made me laugh actually, it's like something out of a you know, Walt Disney cartoon, CBE, so we've got another award, and she's inspecting the police, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, uh, but she's also been involved with the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, which is pretty interesting to us, and the National Rape Monitoring Group. So let's add a couple of other names. Well, of course, we've got Catherine Blair, who's intimately involved with Dotcom Children's Ch uh, Foundation. And we can now reveal that uh, Father Tony Blair actually helped set it up. And we did just pick up that Matrix Chambers, of course, just happens to be, uh, I'm going to say, the original chambers of Sherry Booth. Some people say she stood down from the chambers. Uh, matrix uh, but on the website which i've shown on screen which is her website it appears to indicate that she is still working with Ma with matrix chambers so it seems remarkable that we've got a huge influence by the uh, 
uh, by the uh, Blair family mm -hmm. loitering at the back of um, a supposed investigation into child abuse. Well, if we take a, um, another look at this dot-com children's foundation, uh, we can see Sharon there with a senior police officer. I think this is Mr. Ord, but uh, I'm, I didn't quite check that through before the programme. Uh, but just so that we can say, well, we're telling the truth here on the website is that famous ambassador, Tony Blair. He's all for protecting children when they're not dying um, under bomb, yeah. bombs and bullets in Iraq or Libya or anywhere else. And here we are. He's being promoted as a role model for very young children. Uh, <laughs> clearly, they don't realise the danger in front of them. And this bit is quite incredible because... Um, uh, this organisation, um, .com Children, is linked into the uh, Come Dancing team. So here we are with them promoting what seems to be role models for very young school children. Yeah, I'd put so, those kids at around six, 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 six or seven, I'd say. And um, so we've got this lady with not a lot of clothes on, dancing, and this is role model for young children. So we're just going to say what is actually going on here. Mm. Amazing stuff. Now, into reality, because let's come back on the case of a real child abuse victim, Melanie Shaw. And we want to remind people this week, before her court case, which starts uh, Tuesday next, next week, the 28th, uh, fact or fiction, the strange case of the Nottingham arson attack, which did or did not happen, but was used to imprison Melanie Shaw for three months on no charges. And what we've got on screen there is the original Nottingham uh, Post report. Uh, that was actually on in July the 14th. And here we are. A woman who allegedly set fire to a house in Sherwood has been charged with arson with intent to endanger life. Melanie Shaw, 43 of Bonnington Crescent, Sherwood, is alleged to have set fire to an address in Sherwood on April the 4th. She's also charged with criminal damage alleged to have happened on June the 25th. Shaw has been remanded to appear at Nottingham Crown Court Friday, July the 25th. And from that hearing, she went into prison. Uh, but here it says very clearly that the fire was, on, was in Sherwood on the 4th of April. So if we take a look at this Nottingham Post report, uh, there is a report on a fire at a Sher Sherwood home, uh, except that... Um, this report relates to February the 1st. Nottinghamshire Fire and Rescue were called to a shed fire which spread to a neighbouring house. A crew from Arnold Fire Station attended the blaze at 2.59am in Bonnington Crescent, Sherwood. Now, we've shown recently that um, when some leaflets were put out in this area, none of the local neighbours could actually remember fire yeah. engines turning up which seems remarkable since if they didn't have the sirens on, they would certainly be a mass of blue flashing lights and noise as the fire was brought under control. So and you think some of the homes would have been evacuated? Maybe if they'd spread to one home, they would yes. have got the people out of the, those houses. So surely yep. those people who had to leave their houses would have remembered, well, maybe? Well, this, this is absolutely it. Now, somebody has done some excellent work because they sent in a freedom of information request to get from Nottinghamshire Fire Service their actual data on fires. And if we highlight for you, this is the 4th of April, uh, and you will see there that quite clearly, uh, should be able to bring something up on screen, there are no fires in Sherwood on the 4th of April 2014. Um, in fact, in the Sherwood area, there's none either side of that date either. So we've got a newspaper reporting a fire on the 4th of April, uh, but oh dear, there doesn't seem to be any yeah. evidence from the fire service. But just to make sure that we're, we're being correct here, uh, if we look at another part of the record, uh, we can show you that here on the 1st of April, there was a fire in the Sherwood area, but it just simply says Sherwood City, a refuse fire. Um, Can I just stop one second? Somebody's asking, was it a house or a shed? It was a shed it was that a sh could have spread. That was what the reporting was saying. There was, it, yeah. it was spreading to other houses. It, so was, it was a shed. Garden shed. So the records do show a fire in Sherwood to do with refuse. So it's not linked in any way with the Bonnington address. 
uh, with the 1st of April, but as we've shown, there's no report from the fire service on the 4th. Well, let's remind ourselves that, of course, Nottingham Police uh, also posted uh, that the uh, fire is alleged to have taken place on the 4th of April, and they must know the date the fire took place because they subsequently charged uh, yeah. Melanie with the arson. Now, not only did that date change, I haven't got the slide of that, but we hold it, uh, but if you now attempt to see that page, oh dear, uh, what's happened, the date of Melanie's alleged arson crime has disappeared. Um, so something very, very strange going on. Uh, you would have thought if there was a significant arson attempt and fire engines would call, there would be a record. Well, it gets better because Nottingham Police have refused to release the data on 999 calls relating to fire. Um, so this is part of a lady's text to us. I'd also previously sent an FOI request to Nottinghamshire Police for a very detailed summary of calls to 999 and 101 reporting incidents in fire, incidents of fire in Nottingham for the period January the 1st to June the 30th. And they came back and said it's estimated that the search for one record and extract the information would take approximately uh, 10 minutes, which would equate to approximately 120 working hours. Uh, this means that it, it exceeds the number of working hours uh, that the uh, Act provides for. So they say we're not going to provide the information. So the police have a database of calls. Of course, they could search that database in 10 minutes, but somehow it now equates to 120 working hours to get the information out. No wonder the police can't catch any criminals. So we are going to say um, that Alison Saunders CPS uh, has been hiding evidence exposing um, Cyril Smith, for example. This was all reported in the mainstream press, uh, but has facilitated the imprisonment of abuse victim Melanie Shaw by accepting Nottingham Police prosecution with no substantive evidence in court. Uh, are they protecting paedophiles? I think many people would believe this is the case. So what's the reality of um, the effects of justice in Britain? Well, this is a picture of Melanie Shaw before three months in Sodexo profit-making prison in uh, Peterborough. Uh, this was her the day that we collected her from that prison. And I'm going to tell you that Melanie could barely stand when we actually collected her from outside the prison. She was in such a fragile state that she could barely stand and could barely walk uh, about 50 yards to get into the car. Now, some people have um, said, well, you've talked a lot about Melanie's leg and her ulcer. And uh, I think there's been some curiosity. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of the state of Melanie's leg when she, or soon after she was collected from the prison. This is within a few hours. Uh, some of you may remember we showed a picture of an NHS ulcer, which we used as an example. Uh, this is the state of the ulcer on Melanie's leg. Uh, when she entered prison, this was almost healed as a result of her work and uh, the work of her excellent GP. Uh, you'll notice that there's infection that spread down into her toes and her heel. And we can report with full confidence that NHS England, which is responsible for medical care in HM Prison Peterborough, has refused to take a complaint about her treatment. In fact, their approach to a member of the public who called them uh, was disgusting. I can't use any other word. We can also say that more recently, Derriford Hospital in Plymouth uh, claimed there was no uh, significant infection in Melanie's leg, so she was sent away. And for those wondering uh, what this little device is, well, of course, Melanie is such a dangerous individual uh, that not only has she been released on bail, she's had to be tagged and is under a strict curfew each day from 1700 until nine o'clock the following morning. I'd just like to respond to Imp Bell in the chat room who says his dad disappointed there was no um, video of Melanie's collection. Imp Bell, she was in a very, very frail state. The last thing I think um, Melanie would wanted was cameras in her face. Um, as the same at right, the moment, we do have people asking to, to interview her. She's in, 
you know, she's trying to prepare for her case. She needs looking after and she needs time and um, just a bit of care and concern and um, empathy is needed at the moment. Uh, I'm going to re reinforce that because uh, I have to say that myself and the other lady who picked uh, Melanie up from Peterborough uh, were quite horrified uh, when we saw her condition. And as, as Louise has said, the last thing that Melanie needed was to be uh, put in front of a video camera. So some photographs were taken. We've released some today because we think the time is right to show what this lady has really suffered. Uh, but this is um, not for our amusement. This is reporting the horrific abuse of a child abuse victim and whistleblower. In our opinion, she has clearly been effectively framed in order to get her off the streets, in order to stop her revealing information, not only about children being raped, abused, tortured. Um, well, I'll stop there we within, within Beechwood Home, Nottingham. Uh, but of course, she was also talking about the suicides of children. She was talking about the murders of children. And this is how David Cameron's conserv conservative government treats whistleblowers of child abuse. So when we see this against uh, uh, what uh, Fiona Wolf is trying to do, the scam of this disgusting government to cover up the abuse, and we're using French companies making profit from people like uh, Melanie. Um, I couldn't give a better description of the state of the nation. Over to you. OK, so it's been reported that there was a terrorist attack in Canada. And uh, here I have found a timeline as to what had happened uh, running up to the so-called terrorist attack. On the 21st of October, a uh, Canadian government announced they were going to raise the terror threat level from low to medium after a Quebec, jih Quebec jihadist hit two soldiers with his car, killing one of them. The attacker was then killed by police. And uh, October the 22nd, yesterday, uh, a tall man apparently got out of a Toyota Corolla outside the National War Memorial, Ottawa. And according to witnesses, he was carrying a rifle. Um, a guard was then shot. Uh, it is then being reported that a man hijacks a car and heads to the Parliament buildings. Uh, gunfire is then heard inside Parliament buildings. The building was evacuated. Shortly after, the gunman is reportedly confirmed uh, laying on the floor and shortly after confirmed dead. Not long after this, the Ottawa Civil Hospital confirms two other victims besides the dead soldier. Uh, one had been shot, and uh, but both the both men in the uh, hospital had non-threatening injury, non-life-threatening injuries. Um, and uh, last night, the gunman was named as Michael Zehav Bibauer, and um, he apparently, according to Fox News and uh, other mainstream journalists, has links to ISIS. But if people want to really go and find out an in-depth uh, story about what has happened over in Canada, can I urge everyone to go to Patrick Henningsen's 21st Century Wire when he really does break it down. And I'm not going to go into it. It's a great read. And I urge people to go and have a look at 21st Century Wire and Patrick's take on what has gone on. And we're also going to refer you to another of uh, Patrick's story. Um, he's uh, breaking well down what he calls the UK propaganda, sorry, the CIA propaganda war. The Freudian <laughs> slips are coming out too fast, aren't they? <laughs> Did ISIS mortars really hit US embassy in Baghdad? And in this excellent article, he's describing how the stories have changed. Initially, it's ISIS, it's ISIS, and then it all becomes more and more woolly until it's clear nobody's sure what mm -hmm. was really going on. So um, not only the UK column pulling apart this uh, absolute propaganda across the world, uh, but also, of course, Patrick Henningsen. And just a reminder, if you don't know, Patrick has been pretty poorly over a number of months. He's uh, recovering now and has the advantage, I believe, of sunshine in sunny California instead of grey skies and rain in yeah. Devon. He's hoping to come back, I think, around December. He's hoping to. Well, we hope he will be returning to England, but I think at the moment the dry weather and sunshine is a bit yeah. full in the I know where I'd rather be. <laughs> yeah. Right. OK. Finally, yay, well done Daily Mail for highlighting the dangers of BPA, also known as Basphenol A, a chemical that is used in plastic and tins and also on till receipts. We've covered a BPA and the dangers of it many times here now. Um, so I just want to highlight that well done Daily Mail for finally doing a really good story. And here we go. This is what you can find it in. Plastic bottles, tins, till receipts, you name it. Are they suggesting anywhere. any solutions? 
No, but the my usual, solution is use so. glass bottles, stop buying tins, get fresh food, and uh, when they t go and give you a receipt at the at the tills, if you don't need it, don't take it. I always do. I, I, I never. I always say leak, keep the receipt. I very rarely touch them unless it's items of clothing and stuff, and I need to go back. Right. Never take my receipt. Okay, pollution. Okay, this is fascinating. Uh, this Daily Mail article here is claiming that pollution could be linked to autism. In this article, they say children with ADHD were likely to have been exposed to high level of toxins during a mother's pregnancy and also the first two years of life. Further down the article, they have a piece on the chemical that could cause autism. They list styrene, uh, which is used, uh, uh, used in paint and in plastic. They are calling chromium, uh, a heavy metal used in hardened steel. Some Cyanide, methanol and arsenic, all used in industry and found in vehicle exhaust. Um, but guess what? There is no mention here of vaccines. Now, let's remember, the most vaccines are being put into the children are in their first two years of life. And uh, here we go. Vac Truth, Christina England. Uh, study reveals children being vaccinated with toxic levels of aluminium causing neurological damage and autism. And that's just the aluminium. We do have to remember the thermosol as well. That is also in the vaccines. So um, on that story, Daily Mail, you fail. Thank you. OK. What they really should be looking at is this, of course. Indeed, tonight's show, uh, the No Holds Barred show with me and Danielle. Hopefully Danielle's up to it, she's had a bit of a rough week. Um, but we are going to be interviewing the author and filmmaker Christopher Everard. And uh, he will be live with us tonight on Vinnie Station, the People's Internet Radio, and on our website, noholdsbarredradioshow.com. So he'll be on tonight. OK, well, another reminder for the British Constitution Group conference. Uh, tickets have, have been selling so if you want a place there you need to get hold of a ticket if you haven't already done that uh, we are going to be talking in detail of the um, constitution and common law in uk very very important how do we protect ourselves against uh, this assault on everything that uh, keeps us free in this country so the constitution key issue and vinnie himself has been telling us as an exactly. irishman that uh, you English don't even understand your own constitution. So I think we ought to take a bit of that I advice. I think so. And uh, we're always talking about health. So for those of you with a particular interest in alternative remedies and your health in general, uh, there's something on the Sunday. Self-empowerment. Okay. Take control of your health. It's the first step. Good. Thank you. Okay, well, that's it. Please uh, have a think about uh, the horrific suffering that Melanie Shaw has undergone ever since she was brave enough to speak out publicly about child abuse and perhaps more importantly her concerns that Nottinghamshire police were not doing their duty in Operation Daybreak to investigate and uh, bring uh, child abuse perpetrators to book. So something very nasty going on. We would like to say to you, if you can, please can you attend Nottingham on the 28th of October uh, to attend her court hearing where we will watch with fascination uh, what the evidence is for the charges uh, of arson which have been levelled against Melanie. Uh, we can tell you uh, that we have no further information on the changes of some of the charges because it was rumoured yesterday that the uh, criminal damage charge relating to paint uh, has apparently been dropped in favour of some other charge. So it's it's mm. cooked it up on the spot. I'll leave you at that. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.